Chapter Eighteen, Part Sixteen of Volume Two of A Popular History of France from the Earliest Times. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Volume Two of A Popular History of France from the Earliest Times by Francois Guizot, translated by Robert Black. Chapter Eighteen, The Kingship in France, Part Sixteen. In excessive and arbitrary imposts, indeed, consisted the chief grievance for which France in the fourteenth century had to complain of Philip the Handsome, and probably it was the only wrong for which he upbraided himself. Being badly wounded, out hunting, by a wild boar, and perceiving himself to be in bad case, he gave orders for his removal to Fontainebleau, and there, says Godfrey of Paris, the poet chronicler just quoted in reference to the execution of the Templars, he said and commanded that his children, his brothers, and his other friends should be sent for. They were no long time in coming. They entered Fontainebleau, into the chamber in which the king was, and where there was very little light. So soon as they were there, they asked him how he was, and he answered, Ill in body and in soul. If Our Lady the Virgin save me not by her prayers, I see that death will seize me here. I have put on so many taliages, and laid hands on so many riches, that I shall never be absolved. Sirs, I know I am in such a state that I shall die, methinks to-night, for I suffer grievous hurt from the curses which pursue me. There will be no fine tales to be told of me. Philip's anxiety about his memory was not without foundation. His greed is the vice which has clung to his name. Not only did he load his subjects with poll taxes and other taxes unauthorized by law and the traditions of the feudal system, not only was he unjust and cruel towards the Templars in order to appropriate their riches, but he committed, over and over again, that kind of spoliation which imports most trouble into the general life of a people. He debased the coinage so often and to such an extent that he was everywhere called the base coiner. This was a financial process of which none of his predecessors, neither St. Louis nor Philip Augustus, had set him an example, though they had quite as many costly wars and expeditions to keep up as he had. Some chroniclers of the fourteenth century say that Philip the Handsome was particularly munificent and lavish towards his family and his servants, but it is difficult to meet with any precise proof of this allegation, and we must impute the financial difficulties of Philip the Handsome to his natural greed, and to the secret expenses entailed upon him by his policy of dissimulation and hatred, rather than to his lavish generosity. As he was no stranger to the spirit of order in his own affairs, he tried, towards the end of his reign, to obtain an exact account of his finances. His chief adviser, Enguerrand de Marigny, became his superintendent-general, and on the 19th of January, 1311, at the close of a grand council held at Poissy, Philip passed an ordinance which established, under the headings of expenses and receipts, two distinct tables and treasuries, one for ordinary expenses, the civil list, and the payment of the great bodies of the state, incomes, pensions, and etc., and the other for extraordinary expenses. The ordinary expenses were estimated at one hundred and seventy-five thousand five hundred livres of tour, that is, according to M. Boutaric, who published this ordinance, fifteen million nine hundred thousand francs, about three million eighty-four thousand dollars. Numerous articles regulated the execution of the measure, and the royal treasurers took an oath not to reveal, within two years, the state of their receipts, save to Enguerrand de Marigny, or by order of the king himself. This first budget of the French monarchy dropped out of sight after the death of Philip the Handsome, in the reaction which took place against his government. God forgive him his sins, says Godfrey of Paris, for in the time of his reign great loss came to France, and there was small regret for him. The general history of France has been more indulgent towards Philip the Handsome than his contemporaries were. It has expressed its acknowledgments to him for the progress made, under his sway, by the particular and permanent characteristics of civilization in France. The kingly domain received in the Pyrenees, in Aquitaine, in French Comte, and in Flanders territorial increments which extended national unity. The legislative power of the king penetrated into and secured footing in the lands of his vassals. The scattered semi-sovereigns of feudal society bowed down before the incontestable preeminence of the kingship, which gained the victory in its struggle against the papacy. Far be it from us to attach no importance to the intervention of the deputies of the communes in the States-General of 1302, 
on the occasion of that struggle. It was certainly homage paid to the nascent existence of the Third Estate, but it is puerile to consider that homage as a real step towards public liberties and constitutional government. The burghers of 1302 did not dream of such a thing. Philip, knowing that their feelings were, in this instance, in accordance with his own, summoned them in order to use their cooperation as a useful appendage for himself, and absolute kingship gained more strength by the cooperation than the third estate acquired influence. The general constitution of the judiciary power, as delegated from the kingship, the creation of several classes of magistrates devoted to this great social function, and especially the strong organization and the permanence of the Parliament of Paris, were far more important progressions in the development of civil order and society in France. But it was to the advantage of absolute power that all these facts were turned, and the perverted ability of Philip the Handsome consisted in working them for that single end. He was a profound egotist. He mingled with his imperiousness the leaven of craft and patience, but he was quite a stranger to the two principles which constitute the morality of governments, respect for rights and patriotic sympathy with public sentiment. He concerned himself about nothing but his own position, his own passions, his own wishes, or his own fancies. And this is the radical vice of absolute power. Philip the Handsome is one of the kings of France who have most contributed to stamp upon the kingship in France this lamentable characteristic, from which France has suffered so much, even in the midst of her glories, and which in our time was so grievously atoned for by the kingship itself, when it no longer deserved the reproach. Philip the Handsome left three sons, Louis X, called Le Hutin, the Quarreller, Philip V, called the Long, and Charles IV, called the Handsome, who between them occupied the throne only thirteen years and ten months. None of them distinguished himself by his personal merits, and the events of the three reigns hold scarcely a higher place in history than the actions of the three kings do. Shortly before the death of Philip the Handsome, his greedy despotism had already excited amongst the people such lively discontent that several leagues were formed in Champagne, Burgundy, Artois, and Beauvaisis to resist him, and the members of these leagues, nobles and commoners, say the accounts, engaged to give one another mutual support in their resistance, at their own cost and charges. After the death of Philip the Handsome, the opposition made head more extensively and effectually, and it produced two results. Ten ordinances of Louis the Quarreller for redressing the grievances of the feudal aristocracy, for one, and for the other, the trial and condemnation of Enguerrand de Marigny, coadjutor and rector of the kingdom, under Philip the Handsome. Marigny, at the death of the king his master, had against him, rightly or wrongly, popular clamor and feudal hostility, especially that of Charles of Valois, Philip the Handsome's brother, who acted as leader of the barons. "'What has become of all those subsidies, and all those sums produced by so much tampering with the coinage?' asked the new king one day in council. "'Sir,' said Prince Charles, "'it was Marigny who had the administration of everything, and it is for him to render an account.' "'I'm quite ready,' said Marigny. "'This moment, then,' said the prince, "'most willingly, my lord, I gave a great portion to you.' "'You lie,' cried Charles. "'Nay, you, by God,' replied Marigny. The prince drew his sword, and Marigny was on the point of doing the same. The quarrel was, however, stifled for the moment, but shortly afterwards Marigny was accused, condemned by a commission assembled at Vincennes, and hanged on the gibbet of Montfaucon, which he himself, it is said, had set up. He walked to execution with head erect, saying to the crowd, "'Good folks, pray for me.' Some months afterwards, the young king, who had endorsed the sentence reluctantly, since he did not well know, between his father's brother and minister, which of the two was guilty, left by will a handsome legacy to Marigny's widow, in consideration of the great misfortune which had befallen her and hers. And Charles of Valois himself, falling into a decline, considered himself stricken by the hand of God, as a punishment for the trial of Enguerrand de Marigny, had liberal alms distributed to the poor with this injunction. Pray God for Enguerrand de Marigny, and for the Count of Alois. None can tell, after this lapse of time, whether this remorse proceeded from weakness of mind or sincerity of heart, and which of the two personages was really guilty. But ages afterward, such is the effect of blind, popular clamor and unrighteous judicial proceedings, that the condemned lives in history as a victim, and all but a guileless being. Whilst the feudal aristocracy was thus avenging itself of kingly tyranny, the spirit of Christianity was noiselessly pursuing its work. 
the general enfranchisement of men. Louis the Quarreller had to keep up the war with Flanders, which was continually being renewed, and in order to find, without hateful exactions, the necessary funds, he was advised to offer freedom to the serfs of his domain. Accordingly he issued, on the 3rd of July, 1315, an edict to the following effect. Whereas, according to natural right, every one should be born free, and whereas by certain customs which, from long age, have been introduced into and preserved to this day in our kingdom, many persons amongst our common people have fallen into the bonds of slavery, which much displeaseth us. We, considering that our kingdom is called and named the kingdom of the free, Franks, and willing that the matter should in verity accord with the name, have by our grand council decreed and do decree that generally throughout our whole kingdom such serfdoms will be redeemed to freedom, on fair and suitable conditions, and we will likewise that all other lords who have body-men, or serfs, do take an example by us to bring them to freedom. Great credit has very properly been given to Louis the Quarreller for this edict, but it has not been sufficiently noticed that Philip the Handsome had himself set his sons the example, for on confirming the enfranchisement granted by his brother Charles to the serfs in the county of Valois, he had based his decree on the following grounds. Seeing that every human being, which is made in the image of our Lord, should generally be free by natural right. The history of Christian communities is full of these happy inconsistencies. When a moral and just principle is implanted in the soul, absolute power itself does not completely escape from its healthy influence, and the good makes its way athwart the evil, just as a source of fresh and pure water ceases not to flow and spread over a land wasted by the crimes or follies of men. It is desirable to give an idea and an example of the conduct which was already beginning to be adopted, and of the authority which was already beginning to be exercised in France, amidst the feudal reaction that set in against Philip the Handsome, and amidst the feeble government of his sons, by that magistracy of such recent and petty origin, which was called upon to defend in the king's name order and justice against the countless anarchical tyrannies scattered over the national territory. During the early years of the fifteenth century, a lord of Gascony, Jordan de Lille, of most noble origin, but most ignoble deeds, says a contemporary chronicler, abandoned himself to all manner of irregularities and crimes. Confident in his strength and his connections, for Pope John the twenty-second had given his niece to him in marriage, he committed homicides, entertained evildoers and murderers, countenanced robbers, and rose against the king. He killed, with the man's own truncheon, one of the king's servants, who was wearing the royal livery according to the custom of the royal servants. When his misdeeds were known, he was summoned for trial to Paris, and he went thither surrounded by a stately retinue of counts, nobles, and barons of Aquitaine. He was confined at first in the prison of Châtelet, and when a hearing had been accorded to his reply, and to what he alleged in his defence against the crimes of which he was accused, he was finally pronounced worthy of death by the doctors of the Parliament, and on Trinity Eve he was dragged at the tail of horses and hanged, as he deserved, on the public gallows at Paris. It was assuredly a difficult and a dangerous task for the obscure members of this Parliament, scarcely organized as it was, and quite lately established for a permanence in Paris, to put down such disorders in such men. In the course of its long career the French magistracy has committed many faults, it has more than once either aspired to overstep its proper limits, or failed to fulfill all its duties, but history would be ungrateful and untruthful not to bring into the light the virtues this body has displayed from its humble cradle, and the services it has rendered to France, to her security at home, to her moral dignity, to her intellectual glory, and to the progress of her civilization with all its brilliancy and productiveness, though it is still so imperfect and so thwarted. Another fact which has held an important place in the history of France, and exercised a great influence over her destinies, likewise dates from this period, and that is the exclusion of women from the secession to the throne, by virtue of an article, ill understood, of the Salic law. The ancient law of the Salian Franks, drawn up, probably, in the seventh century, had no statute at all touching this grave question. The article relied upon was merely a regulation of civil law prescribing that no portion of really Salic land, that is to say, in the full territorial ownership of the head of the family, should pass into the possession of women, but it should belong altogether to the virile sex. From the time of Hugh Capet, 
Heirs male had never been wanting to the crown, and the succession in the male line had been a fact uninterrupted indeed, but not due to prescription or law. Louis the Quarreller, at his death, on the 5th of June, 1316, left only a daughter, but his second wife, Queen Clemence, was pregnant. As soon as Philip the Long, then Count of Poitiers, heard of his brother's death, he hurried to Paris, assembled a certain number of barons, and got them to decide that he, if the queen should be delivered of a son, should be regent of the kingdom for eighteen years, but that if she should bear a daughter he should immediately take possession of the crown. On the 15th of November, 1316, the queen gave birth to a son, who was named John, and who figures as John I in the series of French kings, but the child died at the end of five days, and on the 6th of January, 1317, Philip the Long was crowned king at Rheims. He forthwith summoned, there is no knowing exactly where and in what numbers, the clergy, barons, and third estate, who declared on the 2nd of February that the laws and customs invaluably observed among the Franks excluded daughters from the crown. There was no doubt about the fact, but the law was not established, nor even in conformity with the entire feudal system or with general opinion. And thus the kingdom went, says Froissart, as seemeth to many folks out of the right line. But the measure was evidently wise and salutary for France, as well as for the kingship, and it was renewed, after Philip the Long died on the 3rd of January, 1322, and left daughters only, in favour of his brother Charles the Handsome, who died in his turn on the 1st of January, 1328, and likewise left daughters only. The question as to the secession of the throne then lay between the male line represented by Philip, Count of Valois, grandson of Philip the Bold through Charles of Valois, his father, and the female line represented by Edward the Third, King of England, grandson through his mother Isabel, sister of the late King of Charles the Handsome, of Philip the Handsome. A war of more than a century's duration between France and England was the result of this lamentable rivalry, which all but put the kingdom of France under an English king. But France was saved by the stubborn resistance of the national spirit and by Joan of Arc, inspired by God. One hundred and twenty-eight years after the triumph of the national cause, and four years after the accession of Henry the Fourth, which was still disputed by the League, a decree of the Parliament of Paris, dated the 28th of June, 1593, maintained against the pretensions of Spain the authority of the Salic law, and on the 1st of October, 1789, a decree of the National Assembly, in conformity with the formal and unanimous wish of the memorials drawn up by the States-General, gave a fresh sanction to that principle, which confining the heredity of the crown to the male line, had been salvation to the unity and nationality of the monarchy in France. End of chapter 18